helpful for you in your UG classes. Okay, fine. Okay, okay. Yeah, so you're all familiar with some sort of relativity talk in your classes. Okay, right. So, okay, so let's move on with this one. Uh, why I asked relativity was that our first topic today in modern physics will be dealing with relativity. And uh, just two, three things I wanted to clarify. Uh, we are going forward in this coaching in an exam point of view. So we'll not be going into the in-depth theory. We'll be focusing more on exams and the you know problem solving spot. So uh, we'll just go through the subject. We'll just cover all the concepts. Uh, doesn't mean that we'll not cover the concepts. We'll definitely cover all the concepts. And uh, we'll go through the previous year questions as well, asked in uh, uh, IIT exams, JAMS, uh, uh, your uh, ISR exams, your TAFR exams, QSAT, and other QSAT exams as well. So we'll go through all the question, uh, the previous year questions as well, and uh, we'll have weekend exams also. Okay, so that's fine. So I'll just share my screen now. Yeah, I hope my uh, screen is being presented. So in case uh, in between my class, the presentation, any problem happens, so just comment here so that uh, we'll try to rectify that as soon as possible in case you are finding it in uh, any difficulty, OK? I'll just keep in check with the messages at times. OK. so. Good morning, everyone, and so welcome to modern physics. So this is such an interesting part of our domain, our physics subject. Uh, we'll not be wasting much time. We'll directly get into uh, the core of the subject because you are also running out of time. We are also the same. So the topics to be covered here will be uh, the first part, all the five, uh, four or five parts will be about, uh, about relativity, all these things. Uh, the initial frames, Galilean invariance, relativity theory, Lorentz, Galilean transformation, and the two most important things, actually, I have not included one here. Uh, that also will be coming. Uh, one is length contraction, time dilation, as well as there is a Doppler effect, the change in frequency. Uh, you might have known that already. And then there is relativistic velocity addition. The next part, the photoelectric effect, Compton effect, blackboard radiation. These are the experiments, you know, the findings in which modern physics has actually you know, uh, turned away from classical physics, from classical physics to quantum mechanics. This, these experiments are actually the bridge. So we'll be covering that experiment, the Bohr's atomic model, uh, other than the Rutherford model. Then we'll be focusing on X-rays. What are X-rays actually? Then the wave particle duality. There are uh, the topics we discussed before. They have wave particle, uh, wave nature. They have particle nature as well. So we'll talk about the wave particle duality as well. Then we have the uncertainty, superposition, and expectation values. Uncertainty principle, uh, a definite question for your all your QSET exams, you know, uh, whether it be QSET or uh, ICER exams, IATs, TF, or then the Schrodinger equation and the solution for potential well. Potential well, uh, the one dimensional and the three dimensional potential well are almost a guaranteed question for all the exams. Then the harmonic oscillator, another guaranteed question. Step potential, most probable. Uh, harmonic oscillator and step potential we'll do uh, one by one because those will take time. Uh, we will have to un understand in detail and do all the problems properly. So step potential, then the police exclusion principle that no two particles will have same quantum numbers, those things, and the uh, nuclear structure and the binding energy. Because uh, towards the end of modern race, we'll be focusing on uh, the atomic structure, the nuclear structure, this binding energy and uh, those equations along with radioactivity and loss of radioactivity decay. How does radioactive particles decay? So what law do they follow? You know, In what manner do they decay? So those things we'll be covering in radioactivity and radioactive decay. So uh, this is in total an outline of the syllabus that you have. Uh, so this will be covering in uh, around eight to nine classes. So we'll just move on with the uh, first part. So 
an introduction to uh, i'll just meanwhile i'll just take if anyone is facing any trouble i hope no one is facing any trouble so uh, everyone is okay with it i guess okay so we'll continue with this one so this is basically an introduction to what bridges classical physics to modern physics see any theory in physics is brought in or not just in physics any theory in the world any you know new kind of experience and um, new theory new field of study is brought into the world just because the earlier one the one pre existed had some sort of disparities or some sort of problems which they could not solve okay so classical physics also had those things what actually consisted of classical physics classical physics mainly consisted of consisted of classical mechanics electromagnetism and thermodynamics so these three parts what are the what these three parts deal with classical mechanics as we said here classical mechanics for dynamics of material bodies you know the pulley system that we have studied uh, the friction the car you know the planetary motion everything the car moves the planetary motion so every those physical aspects uh, which we in our daily life experience or you know uh, the planetary motions those kind of things those are dealt by classical mechanics then comes the electromagnetism in electromagnetism they studied radiation basically the charges as well as the radiation radiation of light uh, radiation means light and uh, other x radiations as well so those kind of radiations which were then thought to have particle no just wave behavior only so those things were studied in electromagnetism then came not then came along with that was the thermodynamics which explain the interaction between the two means the material bodies and the electromagnetic how do they interact and what kind of generally we know heat dissipation and the energy transformation in terms of heat and the temperature related studies so these were uh, handled by thermodynamics so these three were the core subjects of classical physics mainly the mechan classical mechanics electromagnetism and thermodynamics now in classical physics matter was described in terms of particles radiation was described in terms of waves so as i said earlier the particle see uh, the pen which i hold in my hand the, the cap of the pen this was considered a particle the ball was considered a particle a rope was a particle the sand was a particle so it was just a particle it was nothing else so that was the concept earlier so matter was described in terms of particles radiation was described in terms of waves so uh, in nature there existed two things basically particles and waves that was the concept then okay so there were two kinds of particles one was matter one was wave in classical mechanics all dynamic variables including energy were continuous energy was related with amplitude so uh, that was about classical mechanics you know all dynamic variables what are dynamic variables variables which change with respect to time positions will position will uh, change with, with respect to time momentum can change velocity can change energy can change time you know uh, yeah with respect to time so so these uh, quantities there are several other quantities angular momentum you know spin everything so these quantities uh were continuous okay every including energy every quantity with which uh change with respect to time was same continuous so energy was then related to amplitude as well so that is just, just one part um, you know energy was uh proportional to the uh, fourth power of amplitude so those things were there so in classical mechanics that was energy was you know uh related with amplitude but at the turn of 20th century this is where modern physics started you know at the turn of 20th century what is 20th century from 1900 who came in albert einstein came in albert einstein came in and said several things which were then revolutionary which obviously had many rejections from everywhere but it was then einstein you know what our einstein said everyone believed so at the turn of 20th century classical physics was challenged in two domains in mainly two areas uh, of study classical physics all these classical mechanics classical electromagnetism and thermodynamics everything was challenged and they could not explain several things what were the two domains one was the relativistic domain that is the theory of relativity that we deal with the theory of relativity then the microscopic domain for which quantum mechanics came in so what is relativity relativistic theory basically relativistic theory uh, we deal with particles or matter or radiation whatever moving comparable to the speed of light moving with some sort of velocity which is extremely high that it is almost comparable to the velocity of light what is the velocity of light 
it is roughly 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second for our convenience we take it as 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second exactly i think it is 2.998 so roughly you know rounds of 2 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second so particles or waves or any sort of matter moving with velocity comparable to speed of light is studied in theory of relativity now in relativity we need to understand and interpret the space and time slightly different but in quantum mechanics the underlying philosophy itself is different you know uh, in relativity what we do is we understand space and time differently the space around us the time which we follow these things change this is not the same for me and someone who is moving with very high speed so those there is slightly different it's not you know completely different of course the classical physics holds good for several things but in the uh, uh, domain which where, where the speed of light is comparable so there some changes are there but in quantum mechanics the underlying philosophy you know almost entirely is different now we today are going to talk about relativity that's our you know first topic so in relativity uh, we deal with several things first of all what is motion we'll just go into that uh, i'll just check if once more if everyone is okay yeah if nobody is having any problem so we'll just continue so first of all what is motion because in relativity we deal with moving particles moving with velocity of uh, comparable to speed of light so first of all what is motion Mo uh, by motion we, we, we mean a particle or whatever in the world changes its position with respect to time see uh, i hope everyone can see my mouse cursor at time t1 you know now the mouse cursor is here this is my cursor and after some time the cursor is here so my cursor is moving a distance of this much the mouse pointer is moving a distance of this much so we can say that the cursor is in motion so that's that's it now the frame of reference who says that this pointer is in motion it is me who is saying that this pointer is motion or it is you people who are seeing the cursor at rest telling that this cursor is in motion okay so there is a frame of reference here we are sitting in our own frame and telling that this one is moving okay so what if what if the cursor itself you are sitting on the cursor suppose imagine that me or you are sitting on the cursor itself and you are moving along with the cursor will you see the cursor moving no because you are on the cursor itself so any movement to the cursor will not affect you because you you are the cursor you are in the cursor you or you are the cursor so you will not see the cursor moving so the frame of reference matters from where do we look and from where do we interpret that the cursor is in motion so that is an important thing in relativity where is the frame of reference now the frame of reference there are two kinds of uh, frames of reference two types the first one is inertial the other one is non inertial okay so i hope you have studied uh, the law of inertia in your ug okay so everybody continues to be uh, uh, not continuous everybody tends to maintain its state of uh, uniform rest of motion so that tendency is called inertia okay so what are inertial frames then inertial frames are defined inertial frames are ones in which newton's laws hold good so what are newton's laws newton's laws the three basic newton's laws of motion i have just uh, written here we'll just read through we'll not go deep into that because you already know that everybody continues to be in its in its state of rest or of uniform motion state of rest or of uniform motion whichever it is unless acted upon by an external unbalanced force okay so that is the law of inertia the next one is the rate of change of momentum of a body over time you know rate of change of momentum over time so that is dp momentum is p so a derivative of p with respect to time dp by dt is directly proportional to the force applied and occurs in the same direction as the applied force we know this dp by dt is given as force is f and the third universal law everyone knows every action has an equal and opposite reaction okay so whenever this these three uh, laws hold good we say that the frame is an inertial frame okay so in any of these points do we uh, say that the inertial frames have to be at rest is it a necessity 
No, initial frames need not be addressed all the times. It can be addressed, okay, I agree. But it is not a necessity that initial frames should be addressed. Okay, so the, see, uh, these Newton's laws hold good, then we can say that the initial, the frame is an initial frame. Then, okay, I think I'm just receiving some messages. No, okay, fine. So, okay, so, these initial frames are there. Now, what if initial frames are not there? I told there are initial frames. Then there are non-initial frames. Okay. So what if initial frames are not there? So then comes the importance of relativity. You know, the theory of relativity deals with consequences of not having initial frames. I told uh, we don't have initial frames also. Uh, we have non-initial frames. So in that case, relativity comes into picture. Now. Uh, okay, I say uh, we don't have a relative, uh, you know, inertial frame. What is the problem actually? Why do we need inertial frames all the time? We need relativity uh, for not having inertial frames. I agree that. But why do we need inertial frames all the time? So this is a question, you know, uh, when you think you will get the answer. So I'll just explain to those people who uh, couldn't understand. You know, I measure a length of a meter scale. What is the length of a meter scale? The length of a meter scale is one meter. You know, that's why we call it a meter scale. So the length of a meter scale, I measure just one meter. Okay. That is at rest. I say I'm at rest. So I'm holding the, you know, uh, the meter scale. So with respect to me, the meter scale is at rest and I measure it as one meter. Suppose somebody in Europe or somebody in America, Africa, wherever, they also measure the length of a meter scale they should also get one meter you know if they measure the length of the same meter scale they should also get one meter okay so wherever in the world the length of meter scale should be one meter now how it is one meter all the time because with respect to me if the meter scale is at rest and i'm getting it one meter that same thing if the meter scale is at rest uh, it is at rest with respect to that person wherever in the world. So he also should get one meter. Okay. So if he is not measuring it in an inertial frame, if he is moving, you know, with very high speed and the scale is not moving or the scale is moving, he is not moving, whatever. So uh, if there is a non inertial frame, there, the measurement he gets will be different. It may be 0 0.9 meter, possibly 0 0.8 meter whatever okay less than one meter or, or maybe one meter but less than one meter so there is an inaccuracy there so to standardize these things we all should measure everything in an inertial frame so from an inertial frame if i measure and get one value that value is applicable to all inertial frames everywhere in the world in the universe actually whether it be in you know outside the earth also whether it be in saturn whether it be in space or any other stars so inertial frames the reference uh, you know, if in inertial frame we make one measurement of length, of mass, of time, you know, of velocity, everything. So we should get the standard values. So that is the purpose of having inertial frames. So in uh, so relativity, even if we don't have inertial frames, suppose we are moving and we are to measure. So then relativity helps us. Okay. So who brought in relativity? Of course, Albert Einstein. Sir Albert Einstein. Uh, he brought in the special theory of relativity in 1905. That was his first work. Uh, in 1905, it got published. That was the special theory of relativity, uh, relativity we referred to as STR. And the general theory of relativity almost a year, uh, decade later. So STR was the first to be introduced. And we will be studying about STR now. Okay. So what are the postulates of STR? STR, Albert Einstein said two things. Okay. In special theory of relativity. The first was the law of equivalence. These are the two postulates. You, you should definitely note this down. Okay. So... The two postulates are, first one is the law of equivalence. In the law of equivalence, the laws of physics are all are same in all inertial frames. So, so this is the law of equivalence. See, in inertial frames, the laws of physics are same. So the measurements, everything we make should be same. Okay. The next one is the law of constancy. The speed of light in free space is same in all inertial frames. So this is a tricky one. Uh, maybe everyone may not understand. Most of you, I understand, you will understand it. But uh, we'll get into the details. Okay. So uh, these are the two laws, the law of equivalence and the law of constancy. 
the postulates imply that time and lengths time intervals and lengths are relative quantities whereas speed of light is absolute what does this mean the time interval and lengths are relative quantities relative quantities means it can change uh, from one situation to another uh, if in uh, you know uh, i am sitting here i am not moving i am measuring some time and i am measuring some length someone else is moving with very high velocity he is measuring uh, the same time interval the same length he will get different answers so those are relative quantities the time interval and lengths are relative quantities whereas speed of light is absolute okay the speed of light in any initial frame is absolute it is the same for everyone so how did you arrive at this you know uh, the speed of light is absolute so suppose we consider an experiment i hope you can see my cursor here okay just point at my cursor okay so there is one spaceship which moves from the earth in the upward direction see the direction is given here upward direction with a velocity of 2 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second okay so what is the velocity 2 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second that is the velocity of the spaceship okay it is going up now a person at the ground he is standing on the ground he you know lights a torch bulb so what comes out of it light comes of out of it and what is the velocity of the light it is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second okay it is also going up the space ship is going up the velo the light is also going up so both are going parallelly in the same direction okay now what is the velocity of the light as seen by the person on the ground see so we are standing on the ground we uh, light the torch up the velocity is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second okay now the person who is moving upwards suppose somebody is somebody is inside the spaceship he is moving upwards with a velocity of 2 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second the velocity of light is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second okay so common sense tells us that the 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second is not the velocity of light seen by the person inside the spaceship okay we have uh, talked about we have studied about relative velocity one person going up uh, with 10 meter per second velocity the other going with 8 meter per, uh, per second velocity uh, the relative velocity we see is 10 minus 8 which will be 2 so that is not the case here the velocity seen or velocity of the light seen by the person inside the spaceship is also 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second okay so the velocity of light remains unchanged that was the measurement happened now we uh, we know that now the velocity of light is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second even if the spaceship is going up now why is he able to measure the light, velocity of light as 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second because the spaceship is moving with a constant velocity of some value here it is 2 into 10 raised to 8 okay so some value it is going up with a constant velocity which means the spaceship is an inertial frame since the spaceship is an inertial frame of reference the speed of light will always be 3 into 10 to 8 meter per second for him that was the experimental result okay so for the person standing on the ground and the person moving with very high velocity both observed that the velocity of speed is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second so this is the law of constancy the speed of light is in free space is same in all inertial frames okay we have to consider free space as well okay so it is same in all inertial frames so now the consequences of special theory of relativity there are two consequences uh, 2 3 i'll just check if everyone is okay yeah okay so the main two three topics from which you can expect questions from uh, for your exam okay so one is time dilation time dilation so a classic example for this is the interstellar movie i'll just get into it so what is what does time dilation tell you a moving clock ticks slower the time interval increases when traveling at high speeds okay so we told earlier time and length are relative quantities so time can change length can change speed of light is absolute now how does time change when i am standing on the ground and i see a clock move, moving with very high velocity i see that the time interval of that clock is you know the time of that clock is moving slower okay so for 10 seconds it lapses here for me the moving clock will be 
uh, lapsing a time of less than 10 seconds. Okay, I'll just get into it. Now, here is uh, how you can explain that. Okay, so these are three figures of the same clock. Okay, so this is clock uh, at time zero, at time t by two, at time t. Okay, so this is all, all the same clock. This is the first instance. Now, there are two mirrors which are placed here. One is at the bottom, one is at the top. Now, the light gets reflected, you know, or originated from mirror one. It hits mirror two. Okay, so this is the second instance. It hits mirror two and it comes back. So this is the instance two. And in, in instance three, it goes from mirror one to mirror two again. So it gets uh, originated, reflected back, and then go back, and then go back. Okay, so this process is continuing. Now, the suppose we measure that the time interval for uh, the light pulse to move from one mirror to another is around t by two. Okay, so uh, from here it goes to the mirror. So t by two time lapses. After that it comes here. So another t by two time lapses. So it becomes t. So now it goes again. Now once it hit here, it will be t another t by two here. So the next one will be three t by two towards the left portion. Okay, so. Uh, this is how we set the experiment and the length between two mirrors we set it as L0. Okay, so L0 is the length between two mirrors, say. Now, the velocity with which the light travels is always C. It is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second. So, suppose it is in free space, it is always a constant. Now, the length since it is L0, what is the time taken for uh, the uh, light pulse to go from uh, one mirror to another, it is distance divided by velocity. So that will be L0 by C. Okay. So L0 by C will be towards one direction. From lower mirror to upper mirror, it will be L0 by C. From upper mirror to lower mirror, it will be another L0 by C. Okay. So for one complete, you know, cycle, it takes a time of around two L0 by C. Okay, see, uh, this time it is given uh, to be, uh, it is T here. It is after completing the two cycles. Okay, this, once this uh, half cycle is also completed, this time will be uh, another 3T by T. Okay, so the time taken for one complete cycle is 2L0 by C. Now, what if we said that the clock, these are three instances, the clock is stationary here, okay. So the clock we assume here is stationary. These are three instances of the same clock. What if the clock is moving? That is the next question. We are uh, talking about moving particles. So, okay. So in this uh, figure, the clock is moving from one part to another. Initially it was here, then it is here, then it is here. Okay, so the clock is continuously moving. Here the clock was stationary. We just took three pictures, three different pictures. Now, the light starts from here. Okay. It, hits the upper mirror but by the time it hits the upper mirror it had traveled a uh, time uh, you know uh, a distance of this much okay this was a distance covered now after hitting this one it went back to here by that time the clock moved this much distance also now the clock is moving now suppose the clock is moving at a velocity v okay v is the velocity i hope you can see here v is the velocity now what is the time elapsed between pulse from one mirror to another, it is around t by two. Okay, so that is what we got here also. That is here also. So in time t by two, the distance the light travels will be velocity into time distance. So that is c into t by two. So that is this distance. And this distance we know it as l, l zero. Okay, now the velocity of the clock is v. So this horizontal distance in time t by 2 will be v t by 2. Okay, so as you can see, now this forms a right angle triangle. So we can directly apply Pythagoras theorem. Once we apply Pythagoras theorem, what we will get is c t by 2. Hypotenuse square is equal to square of other two sides. L0 square plus v t by 2 square. Now, once you solve that, uh, this is just simplification. You can just note this down. This is just simplification. It is also available in Arthur Bayser, the textbook. Okay, so once you solve that, what you will get is the t square. Once you calculate for t square, solve for t square, what you will get is 2 L0 square by c square divided by under root of 1 minus v square by c square, which means the time elapsed for one complete pulse here 
okay so uh, the time elapses here okay the t by 2 time the t by 2 time elapses here is equivalent to another uh, it defies by another factor it is actually 2 l not by c divided by under root of 1 minus v square by c square now what is 2 l not by c that is t0 okay so t equal to t0 divided by under root of 1 minus v square by c square so we write this as t is t0 divided by t0 times gamma where gamma is 1 by under root of 1 minus v square by c square okay so uh, if you want i'll just okay uh, we'll get back to it uh, we'll once we do the problem we'll do it in detail okay so anyway t times uh, t is equal to t0 times gamma where gamma is written as 1 by under root of 1 minus v square by c square okay where v is the velocity of the moving clock okay so i hope that is clear now uh, we have mathematically proven that once the clock moves the time for the same time interval as measured at rest that time interval is expanded here okay so a moving clock ticks slower now the next one is length contraction okay we told time and length are relative now how uh, we'll see, just see how length is related you know length uh, changes a moving road appears to be shorter in length length of a moving object contract contracts as observed by an observer at rest okay so i am at rest here i am watching a moving road a meter scale is moving okay so when a meter scale is moving with very high velocity and if i measure that length sitting at rest at you know and the earth i will uh, measure the length not as 1 meter but some value less than 1 meter the length contracts now how do we explain this one we have uh, you know a practical explanation for this one cosmic ray muons muons are elementary particles uh, we will study that in elementary particles as well as uh, maybe in nuclear physics we we'll have to come across this one radioactivity also so cosmic ray muons have a lifetime of 2.2 microseconds okay so 2.2 microseconds is the lifetime of a muons that's how they that's how long they live after 2.2 microseconds they disappear okay so that is the t0 they travel at a speed of 2.994 newton per second meter per second that is 0.998 c so the velocity is very many very much comparable to that of velocity of light so we got the time we got the velocity now average distance they travel you know distance is velocity into time that is v into t0 that when calculated we uh, will get as 0.66 km okay so that is the distance they will travel now we have a problem here what is the problem but muons are created at altitudes of 6 km or more okay so uh, at 6 km or more muons are created now i'll just share a white board here i'll just practically explain this one Yeah, I hope the whiteboard is clear to everyone. Okay, so from the ground level, suppose this is the ground level. Okay, from the ground level, muons are created at a altitude of suppose these are muons here. Muons are created at altitudes of around this is the ground level. Okay, at around six kilometer. Uh, you know, my handwriting is not the best one, so please help us with this one. Okay, so at a uh, height of around six kilometer. but the average distance we calculated they can travel is around 0.6 km i'll just write it again 0.6 km okay so this is the distance they can travel now how can they travel this 6 km because what we have calculated is 0.6 km so this was the problem now i'll just go back to the ppt now the quantities we measured here 2.2 microseconds lifetime that has a problem now how do they travel this distance that's our problem the lifetime of muon is as observed in its own frame of reference means when you are sitting on the muon you know when you are sitting on this muon this particle here 
when you are sitting here you measure the lifetime as 2.2 microseconds the lifetime is 2.2 microseconds okay so this is the uh, time you calculate but that is not the case when you are measuring it from earth from earth we are telling that the muons travel a distance of you know this much kilometer from earth we are telling that it is traveling a 6 kilometer distance so that is not the case when you are sitting on the moon muon when you are sitting on the muon the lifetime is not actually 2.2 microseconds that lifetime changes by t equal to t not times t0 times gamma okay so when calculated that lifetime becomes around 34 microseconds okay there is a time dilation there when there is a time dilation you are sitting on the muon that is not the time then the lifetime is not 2.2 microseconds it is around 34 microseconds now in 34 microseconds how much can it travel i'll just write here or oh, maybe yeah in 34 microseconds the distance it can travel is velocity into time so the distance it can travel d is equal to the velocity is 0.998 c into what is the uh, this one lifetime the lifetime is around 34 into 10 raised to minus 6 seconds okay so when you calculate what you get is around uh, no it, it is around 10.6 km somewhere there okay not the exact value this is the rough value but somewhere there uh, you will get it as you will get somewhere around 10.6 km so now this is justified how a muon can travel this much distance see uh, it had to travel 6 km that 6 km is as measured by person on the earth a person on the earth measures it as 6 km now <clears throat> uh, we have proven that it can travel a total length of 10.6 km so if it can tra tra travel 10.6 km 6 km is not a problem okay so it can travel 6 km now since light is an absolute quantity time and length are relative the only way to explain this one is see uh, yeah it travels around 10.4 km now but if what if someone travels with the muon if someone is sitting on the muon the lifetime is 2.2 uh, microsecond and the velocity is 0.98 c we told that the only way to account this is length contract by the same amount see uh, you are sitting on the muon you can travel only 2.2 microseconds for that time only you, you will be alive okay so in that microseconds you will have to travel an equivalent length of 6 uh, 6 km or Uh, that length to reach the sea level okay so from the muon if you are looking that length that height you know the height we drew here from the muon if you are looking it is not 6 km it is l0 by gamma it contracts by a significant amount and that amount is uh, what we called length contraction from if you are sitting on the muon the, the length in inertial frame what you will get is l0 times Under root of one minus v square by c square, that is L zero by gamma. So the length contracts by an amount gamma. Okay, so this is length contraction. I hope you understood this one. Now, similar to how length and time change, mass also changes by a factor of gamma. So there is another quantity. Uh, we have studied basic quantities like mass, length, and time in our you know uh, UG. So in our plus one plus two as well in units and dimensions chapter. So mass, length, and time changes by a factor of gamma. Now how do all they change? If the rest mass is m. its mass when moving at a velocity m is m no times gamma okay so gamma is 1 by under root of 1 minus v square by c square we told so it changes by that much times uh, hence we can conclude time dilates means time takes longer length shortens and mass increases for a moving object when when observed by an observer at rest okay now remember gamma is always greater than 1 always from mathematically we can prove that this v is always less than c because no nothing can travel at the speed of light or greater than the speed of light so v by c will be less than 1 v square by c square will be very much less than 1 uh, 
you are subtracting one minus something less than one, say 0.5, one minus 0.5, it will be 0.5 something here. So one divided by a quantity less than one. So gamma is always greater than one. Just remember this, gamma is always greater than one. So we can just conclude these three points, you definitely note it down. Mass is M0 times gamma. Since gamma is greater than one, mass increases. T is T0 times gamma, it is, that also increases. L is L0 by gamma, length contracts, okay. So these are the three quantities which are affected by virtue of a particle's motion comparable to the velocity of light. Okay, so I hope you noted these three these three things. Now, uh, this example which I uh, you know told here, you can just write down the details if you want. Uh, we'll get to the I hope we'll get to the PPT as well. You know the PDF as well because this instance the uh, these quantities were directly asked in TA for example. Okay, so this was a direct question. This muon example itself having all the similar altitudes. So this was a direct question in TFR exam once. Now the next one is the Doppler effect. Okay, in Doppler effect, what happens? What happens is the frequency of wave. Okay, the frequency of waves changes when the source and receiver are in motion relative to each other. Okay, so if a source produces a sound and there is an observer and these two are in motion in relative motion with respect to one another i'm sorry yeah uh, relative motion with respect to one another then there is a change of frequency now this is not as simple as you think we can tell that there is a change in the loudness of the voice see when you go to the source of the voice you will get a louder sound that is fine that is acceptable but how does the frequency of the change uh, you know frequency of the source change. frequency is the property of the source how does that one change you know it should not actually change but by virtue of motion it changes now successive waves emitted by a source moving upward moving towards an observer are closer together than normal because of the advance of the source okay now uh, i'll just explain this one successive waves uh, emitted by a source moving towards an observer okay we'll just uh, take the whiteboard once more okay now uh, suppose there's a source here there's a source here which produces you know sound waves whatever waves okay so there's a source here and an observer an observer is moving uh, okay uh, i'll just remove this one also an observer was actually standing here okay at this position an observer standing here standing okay and now he is listening to some uh, so the sound with the frequency of f f okay whatever okay so he is listening to that frequency and that frequency he listens as f now after a time t he moves to this position the frequency he now he listens is f dash say f dash okay f dash now what Doppler effect tells is, since the observer is moving in this direction towards source, okay, this is the source. So since it is, uh, since the observer is moving towards the source, now the frequency with which he hears the sound, it will be greater. Doppler effect tells us F dash will be greater than F. Now what is the reason for this one? Okay, so this is the simple explanation. Now what is the reason for this one? Successive waves emitted by the source are closer together than normal because of the advance of the source. Okay, so initially, okay, I'll just take the next page. Initially, uh, the wave was this one, and the observer was here. Okay, then there is a next wave. Uh, the source produces waves continuously as this one. Okay. The source produces waves continuously. It will be another wave. It will be another wave. It will be another wave. It produces continuous waves. Now, once it, uh, one, the observer was initially at this position. Now it is at this position. So it had already the observer has already brought it to the, the first wave at this position, and the next wave is coming, and it has to travel only this much velocity, means this much distance. Okay, the initial wave had to travel this much distance. The next wave has to travel only this much distance. Okay, so the next wave, this is the wave two, this is the wave one. The wave, okay, 
Yeah, this is the wave wave two and wave one. So the wave two has to travel a shorter distance to reach the observer. Okay, so which means the wavelength with which the observer receives is shorter, is lesser. So the frequency is more. We all know the relation V is equal to C by nu. Oh, not V is equal to C. Well, lambda is equal to C by nu. I'm sorry for that. Lambda is equal to C frequency. So lambda is inversely proportional to frequency. Okay. So since the lambda, the wave, the length here is lesser, the frequency will be more. Okay. So that is a simple explanation. Now the Doppler effect in sound. How is it? Uh, you know, explained in terms of mathematical equation. The relationship between the source frequency F0 and the observed frequency F is F equal to F0 into 1 plus V by C by 1 minus V by C. Remember and take care that the two V, the two velocities are different. Those are not the same. Okay, the two velocities are different. So just note down, note down this equation. F equal to F0 into 1 plus V by C by 1 minus V by C. This is a very probable question for your exams. Okay, so Doppler effect in sound, where small v is the speed of the observer. Okay, so with what velocity the observer moves towards or away from the source. Now, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, then the capital V is the speed of the source. Okay, is the source also moving? The source can move, the observer can move, both can also move. So, okay, so if the source is also moving, there will be some velocity. So that is the uh, v in the denominator. Now, this is the equation for Doppler effect in sound. I hope you all uh, noted it down. The Doppler effect in light is different from that of sound. Since sound requires a material medium to travel and the medium itself acts as a frame of reference. Okay. So, uh, the light, the Doppler effect in light is actually different. Now, how is this different? In terms of sound, the sound actually travels through a material medium, through compressions and rarefactions. We have studied this one. Sound requires a material medium to travel. Now, in that medium, that medium itself is a frame of reference. Okay, sitting in the medium itself, we can, uh, you know, calculate the uh, frequency, the velocity, everything. So that itself is a frame of reference. Is that the case with light? No, light does not require a medium of, you know, travel. It can travel through vacuum also. So there is no frame of reference through which you know the light travels but that is not the case with sound with sound it travels through a medium and in that since there is a medium the doppler effect can be different now how is the doppler effect of light different from that of sound we'll also consider the doppler effect of light that is the next one doppler effect in light so here i am assuming that the original frequency is f0 okay f0 initial frequency the apparent frequency means the frequency uh, that the observer gets so that is a there is a change in frequency we told that so there is that change in frequency that new frequency is f and the velocity of observer is v okay so the velocity of observer is the only thing that matters here now the relationship between f0 and f is transverse motion of observer f equal to f0 under root of 1 minus v squared by c squared okay so how is the transverse motion means i'll just get you Okay, so there is a source here. This is the source. The source produces all those waves and the observer O is moving in a transverse direction. Okay, so this is this is the direction of the wave of the sound wave of the light wave whatever. But this is the direction of observer. So observer is in uh, the these two are in transverse motion. Okay, so in case of transverse motion, how does the equation change? In case of transverse motion, the proper time, you know, uh, for actually, excuse me. Yeah, there was some disturbance here. Yeah. Uh, so in case of transverse motion, suppose there are two waves and the uh, there are two waves here. Okay, one. I'll just go to another page. Yeah, there are two waves here. One wave is coming to him, so he is here. Another wave is also coming to him. By that time, he is here.
initially he was here another wave is actually uh, coming okay another wave is actually coming to him by that time he reaches here okay so there is a time difference between the arrival of wave 1 and wave 2 that is because that is because the observer is moving with some velocity v okay with some velocity v he is moving and now there is a change in frequency and there is a change in length also the initial the wave 1 had to travel this much distance wave 2 had to travel this much distance this is the much longer distance okay so there is a difference in time for wave 1 to reach the observer and wave 2 so that change in time creates a change in frequency as well so how much by what factor does it change that also changes by a factor of gamma there is uh, you know a small uh, derivation kind of thing for this one if you want i can uh, do that but uh, it's actually a small one we need not you know focus much on this one uh, i hope if you can study the formula that will be fine because these formulas are similar for you know the transverse motion the observer receiving receding and the observer approaching so these are similar formulas you can just learn that one and the uh, if you want we can give it as a ppt uh, you know pdf or uh, should i do this one now because it may take some time i hope we can continue with this one okay and we will continue with this one so just note down this apparent frequency the apparent frequency is given as f0 times under root of 1 minus v squared by c squared so this is actually f0 by gamma the frequency you know decreases so f0 is the initial frequency what if the next portion is what if the observer is receding from the source okay now we actually told about observer approaching the source the observer will now be receding from the source means going away from the source in that case f equal to f0 into under root of 1 minus v by c by 1 plus v by c there is also a small derivation for this one uh, we'll give it as a pdf for you so that would be better because uh, it may take some time we have to do some problems also today okay so this is 1 minus v by c by 1 plus v by c under root of so that also changes by some factor now observer is moving towards the source then f equal to f0 into under root of 1 plus v by c by 1 minus v by c okay now just compare these equations see equation just note it down i just give time to note it down observer moving towards sources this one okay now i hope you wrote this one now now compare equations 2 and 3 in equation 2 the observer is receiving from the source moving away from the source since it is moving away from the source the time taken for the second wave to reach the observer will be more so since the time is more the frequency will be lesser okay so observer is moving away from the source the apparent frequency you will be receiving is lesser on the other hand if the observer is moving towards the source the frequency will be more because time taken for the second wave to reach the observer will be lesser since time is less frequency is more frequency and time are inversely proportional okay so how can we uh, attain that from this equation see from uh, in the first equation the numerator under root of the numerator is 1 minus v by c okay so it, you are subtracting something from 1 so that is a lesser quantity compared to the uh, denominator the denominator is 1 plus v by c this is 1 minus v by c so this is a lesser quantity so receding from the source it will be minus in the numerator once the observer is moving towards the source it will be plus in the numerator okay so the numerator is more the total quantity is more here the numerator is less the total quantity is less okay so in that way you can just memorize this one i just told to memorize this one okay so just have these equations intact with you and most importantly this one these three things m equal to n naught times gamma it increases t is equal to t naught times gamma that also increases l equal to l naught times l naught by gamma okay okay so uh, in fact i initially I told uh, just i'll just take the example of that interstellar movie the dad and you know uh, the daughter cooper and murph so uh, we are people i think uh, you have you since your physics uh, most of you might have seen it all, all of my team you have seen it so actually cooper goes for you know adventure you know adventure kind of thing so he goes to you know other part of the universe he 
you know explores where life is available so he he is moving at some high velocity so from our earth his clock should be ticking slower okay so because we are at rest and we are watching him move with very high velocity so his his time is actually moving much slower okay for us 10 years here it may be some 3 minutes for him it is very slow his clock is very slow so that is why in the end his daughter you know murph is actually extremely old and cooper is almost of the same age as you know he left here okay so that is an you know uh, extremely good example of time dilation so just you know, keep that in mind if in case you you know have some doubt about time dilation those are you know easy examples to remember so uh, since we have uh, done this much we'll just focus on some problems we'll just do uh, four or five problems and then we'll wind it up okay so uh, just write down this question uh, the first question we'll do one by one just, there are just five questions i hope you will have enough time for that okay while at rest an electron has a mass of 9 into 10 by 11 into 10 by 9.11 into 10 by minus 28 grams i'm sorry what will be its mass when it, this is moving okay this is moving when it is moving at a speed of 0.95 c okay so just note this down the mass is 9.11 into 10 by minus 28 that is in gram that is not kilogram it is in gram just mind it then it is moving at 0.95 c what we need to find what will be its mass okay it is moving at a 0.95 c so uh, we'll just uh, note all these things down yeah so yeah so uh, this is i'm sorry my handwriting now uh, you will have to adjust with this for a while okay so these are the data given to us okay so what are the data it is mass is given 9.11 into 10 raised minus 28 velocity is 0.95 c okay so what will be the mass can you just calculate we already have the formula this is actually a question from jam okay so we know that m is equal to m0 times gamma okay m equal to m0 times gamma so that is equal to m0 times m0 divided by m0 okay i'll not write divided by that is m0 into what is gamma 1 by under root of 1 minus v squared by c squared okay so this is m0 by and m0 times gamma now what is v here v is 0.95 c okay the velocity is 0.95 c so just substitute v in that value what is m0 here m0 is 9.11 Uh, there is a point here 9.11 into 10 raised to minus 28 gram so just substitute the formula and uh, i'll just give you the options uh, these are the options just do it in gram only don't convert it to kilogram because all the answers are given in gram okay uh, just calculate and uh, if completed just comment the options the option number a b c or d okay just comment the options i hope everyone got the problem this is the problem for you once again the first problem electron has a mass of this much the velocity is given what will be its apparent mass 0.95 is okay so just come in okay some of you are commenting i'll just wait uh, one more minute so that others can yeah i will reveal the answer after you know one minute so that okay some of you got this answer fine we'll just see if that's the answer Okay, can others please comment the answer? We uh, the velocity is given, the mass is also given. 
So this is a simple cal calculation. It's a uh, straightforward calculation. Yeah, the answer for it is 2.9 raised to minus 27 gram. It is option A only. Okay. So option A is the answer. So that's fine. Uh, we'll just go to the next problem. Just note down the next problem. Light of wavelength 497 nanometer appears to have a wavelength of 500.2 nanometer when it reaches Earth from a distant star. What is the velocity of the star if the velocity of light is this much? Okay. Now, uh, the concept to be used here, it is length contraction. Am I right? Some of you are actually having, you know, uh, actually having been seen wavelength, you may see it, uh, you may see it as length contraction. It is not actually length contraction because the length is not being contracted here. Light of wavelength 497 nanometer. I hope uh, others have done the problem, right? Uh, shall I continue with the next one? Because this is an important one. This is Doppler reflect. Uh, you all need to focus this one properly. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go to the next problem. Uh, if you're doing the other one, uh, you can do it later. Don't worry. That's a straightforward calculation. Just stop it and just uh, listen to this one. The wavelength is actually 497 nanometer. Now, uh, it, it is appearing to have a wavelength of 500.2. So the length is actually increasing here. So you can never say that the length is being contracted. And not only that, it is talking about the wavelength and frequency of light. So that is not about, you know, the length of some material object. So this is actually Doppler effect. Since the wavelength is increasing, you can say that the frequency is decreasing. As we told earlier, lambda is inversely proportional to frequency. Lambda equal to C by nu or C by F. So wavelength increases, frequency decreases. Now, light of wavelength 497 nanometer appears to have 500.2. So now we can calculate the F, the F0 and the F. Okay, what is F0? F0 is the frequency corresponding to 497 nanometer. Okay, so now uh, F is how much? F is around 500.2 nanometer. That corresponding uh, frequency is F. So that is when it reaches Earth from a distance. Now, what is the velocity if the speed of light is given? Okay, now what should be used here? Which equation should be used here? We should actually be using observer receiving from the source because the apparent frequency is lesser than or uh, or is it more uh, i'm sorry i just go to the problem okay yeah okay yeah the uh, light of wavelength so the initial frequency f0 is greater and f is smaller okay so the oh i'm sorry <coughs> So the, since the initial frequency is greater, okay, F0 is greater than F, so we'll be using this one. Observer is receding from the source. Okay, since the observer is receding from the source, what you get is the equation 2. So it is 1 minus V by C by under root of um, 1 plus V by C. Now the F and F0 are given. Actually, F and F0 are not given, but the corresponding lambda and lambda and lambda 0 are given. So from that you can calculate the corresponding frequency and do the problem okay i'll just help you out with this one don't worry okay so the initial frequency f0 f0 is equal to c by lambda 0 how much is c uh, see, you can put that value that is 3 into 10 raised to 8 divided by that is meter per second is there. What is lambda 0? Lambda 0 is actually 497 nanometer. Nanometer means into 10 raised to minus 9. I'm sorry with this one. Yeah, into 10 raised to minus 9. Okay, so uh, this is F0. You can calculate this one. What is F? Similarly, you can find F also C by lambda. Where, uh, what is the second lambda? C, it remains the same, it is C itself. It is 500.2, sorry, 100.2 into 10 raised to minus 9. Okay. I'm sorry, 10 raised to minus 9. Okay. So you will get F0 and F. 
from these two values. Now, just put that in the equation. You know f0 and f, you know the value of c. So from that, you can find v, velocity. OK, just do the problem and uh, can some of you, uh, one of you come in? Just do a rough calculation, you know, uh, taking um, a round, uh, round of figures and do the calculation. Can uh, someone please come and answer? Just use the formula f is equal to f0 the root of 1 minus v by c divided by 1 plus v by c. You will calculate f and f0 and the remaining values. Okay, the main thing to understand here is that when you're talking about wavelength and load, that is not about length, contraction and load, it will be about Doppler effect, okay. Okay, you may be taking some time to calculate that one, but those are the calculation part. You can definitely do that. I'll just get you the answer. And before that, just understand how we did this problem. Uh, the initial, I'll just uh, go to the problem once again. See, the light of wavelength 497 appears to be 502. So the initial uh, wavelength is 497. The apparent wavelength is 500.2. So lambda 0 is 497. Lambda is uh, 500.2. So lambda 0, 497 less than 500. Lambda 0 less than lambda. So F0 will be greater than lambda F because these will be inversely proportional. Lambda and F are inversely proportional. So frequency will be more. Since frequency will be more, means initial frequency will be more, the final frequency will be less. Understand that the observer is receding from the source. Since the observer is receding from the source, the equation we have to use is M3. The equation we have to use is equation 2, not equation 3. Okay. If the apparent frequency is greater, then use the observer is moving towards the source. Okay. Understand the concept. Now, the answer for this one is option A again. Uh, the calculation I got was around 1.96 into 10 raised to 6. So it rounds off to 2 into 10 raised to 6. So that's the answer I got. Just come in with your answers as well. Uh, so that is the answer for question number two. Now, the question number three can also be done easily by you. Uh, just do question number three. How fast must an object be moving if its apparent mass is to be one percentage larger than its rest mass? OK, so what is the info given here? OK, so what info is given here? I'm sorry. What info is given here? M is greater than M0 by 1 percentage. OK, so M is greater than M0 divided by 1 percentage. OK, understand this as percentage, OK? OK, now, if 
the initial mass m0 m0 is 1 times m0 1 into m0 is m0 so then the final mass is now 1.01 m0 okay that is one percentage i hope you got one percentage how i wrote this 1.01 okay so m0 is moved to 1.01 times m0 so the uh, the mass now is the apparent mass is 1.01 times m0 which means m equal to m0 times gamma we wrote okay which means what is m it is actually 1.01 1.01 times m0 okay 1.01 times m0 equal to m0 times gamma which means this m0 and this m0 is cancelled what you will get is gamma equal to 1.01 which means i'll just write on the upper side which means 1 1 divided by under root of 1 minus v squared by c squared equal to 1.01 now we know the value of c c is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second okay so from that you can calculate the value of v so just calculate the value of v and just comment the answer please calculate the value of v how much how in what velocity these are the options 4.2 into 10 raised to 7 5 9 and 3 all the odd numbers so the answer will be somewhere around 4.2 what is the fraction you get I mean, so not fraction, what is the power of 10 to the power of what? Just comment your answers. Yeah, Charles has commented something. Okay. Others also, please do the problem. Just please comment because this slide, uh, you know, comparatively simpler problem. We just need to find the B. C is given. Okay, so the answer you get is. 4.2 into 10 raised to 7, so option A, so uh, what he said was correct. So uh, you, you can just do the calculation, that's easier. Okay, so just do the calculations, that is just mathematics. Now the next one, the next one is also time dilation actually. This problem, problem number 4, a, space, a spacecraft is moving relative to Earth. An observer on the Earth finds that between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m., according to her clock, 3,601 3, seconds elapsed on the spacecraft score. Okay, what is a spacecraft speed relative to Earth? Okay, so that is a question. So what are the information we get here? Observer on the Earth finds that. So observer is sitting on the Earth. So his time or his or her time is the proper time. Okay, so between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. What is 1 p.m. and 2 p.m.? The time in between it is one hour. One hour means in SI units, we have to convert it to seconds because the next one is also given in seconds. So one hour is 60 minutes into 60 seconds. That is 3,600 seconds. Okay. I'll just note those values. And you need to do this one by your own. By your own. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. So the time T0, the proper time T0 is measured as 
is measured as 3600 seconds that is in earth okay now what is the t as measured in the space cast clock it is 3601 second okay now what they are asking what is the velocity okay we know t is equal to t naught into gamma that's equal to t naught into into 1 by under root of 1 minus v squared by c squared right so 1 1 minus v squared by c squared okay so you have all the values here uh, you have uh, t t naught here you have uh, t here and you just need to know the value of v so that's a straightforward calculation you can do that by your and uh, the answer for that okay i'll reveal it in the next class just find the answer and uh, just let me know okay so the next was the next question everyone i need everyone's proper attention attention here because the next one is a very good question it's actually from tfr uh, these are also uh, old all these are previous year questions in some exams or uh, some of them are from hcu the other is iit uh, the the last one is from tfr okay there are still questions on relativity uh, we did not cover that uh, you know topic yet so we'll do that now this is the final question in the final question what we'll do is uh, this is the question okay okay so from an observe from an observational post e on earth okay someone is observing from there two ballistic missiles each of us length l okay so this length is l this length is also l l from nose tip to tail end okay that length is l are observed to fly past each other so they are flying in opposite direction as can be seen from the figure they are flying in opposite direction with the same uniform relativistic speed c by 2 so each of them are having a velocity of c by 2 c by 2 each okay now in opposite direction what is the time taken for the tail end of one of the missiles to cross the tail end of the other missile <clears throat> I'll just do it in the whiteboard. So I will write all the quantities here. Okay. Now, what are given? Two missiles are given. Okay. I'll just do boxes here. Just draw two boxes here. Okay. This is one. This is the other one. The length, this length is given as L. This length is also given as L. Okay, so with two, uh, uh, the lengths are L and L same. So one is moving in this direction, the other is moving in this direction. What are the velocities? The velocity here is C by 2. The velocity here is also C by 2. The velocity here is also C by 2. Okay, so two, uh, two are moving in C by 2, C by 2 velocity with length L. Okay, now <coughs> the tail end means tail end, uh, the tail end is actually this one. I'll note it with another color. The tail end is actually this one. The tail end of one should fly past the tail end of other. Okay. Now, from the question, we have to imagine that right now these are meeting at a point, means the uh, this point. Let the length be up to this one, and this length be up to this one. Okay, so this is the length. Right now they are meeting at some point. That is the green line. Okay. Now the tail end of one, the tail end of the first one, this one, the tail end should actually cross the tail end of the other. So the total length it has to travel is this much okay this is the total length it has to travel now what is the total length it is l plus l it is 2l is it 2l it is not actually 2l because we are observing it from the earth okay, i'll just zoom it out okay we are observing this one from the earth from the earth when you're observing the length is not actually 2l the, this this l and this l these are the lengths when observed 
with respect to uh, at rest with respect to the rocket these are the actual lengths but when we look from here the length is not l okay when we look from here the length is actually contracted we have studied length contraction by how far does the length contract this length l will become l0 by gamma this will also become l0 by gamma so l0 by gamma and l0 by gamma these are the lengths which we see while standing on the earth okay so but what will be the velocity the velocity will always be c by 2 c by 2 okay it is given that it is moving at a velocity of c by 2 with respect to earth that is already given now you know the uh, this one also what the length also the length is l known by gamma this one is also l known by gamma so you know the distance you know the velocity just calculate the time taken okay so what is the total distance the total distance will be sum of these two okay this one and this one so i'll just write in the next page the total distance to be covered is l not by gamma plus l not by gamma with a velocity of c by 2 now is it actually c by 2 velocity the velocity is not just c by 2 the velocity will be c by 2 plus c by 2 why c by 2 plus c by 2 because this one previous page yeah because the tail end of the first one should actually cross the tail end of the second one so this is the total length to be traveled there is no doubt about it now once uh, now at the same time rocket a is moving to this side rocket b is moving to this side as well so there is a relative motion between those two also if this one was at rest okay see if this one was at rest and the tail end of this one this tail end okay this tail end should actually cross this point it 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 is to cross this point then the total length is as we said uh, that length and the velocity will be c by 2 but the velocity is not just c by 2 the the rocket b is also moving in this direction so we have to take that also so the total velocity will be c okay so the total velocity will be c it will be c by 2 plus c by 2 total length is 2 okay the total length will be 2 l not by gamma l not by gamma oh i'm sorry 2 l not by gamma and the total velocity will be c just calculate gamma because calculating gamma is easier what is gamma gamma is the velocity of the first one gamma will be 1 by under root of 1 minus v squared what is v it is c by 2 c by 2 whole squared divided by c squared okay yeah the handwriting uh, is actually really bad but uh, please understand the concept so this is how it works i'll just explain it once more if somebody uh, is still in confusion just explain it in short okay so there are two missiles here missile a is going in this direction okay i will draw the other one with a different color missile b is going in this direction these are going in two opposite directions okay one is going this side and the other is going in the opposite direction so they meet at this uh, point and Straight line. The the length of this one proper length is l zero. This proper length is also l zero. This velocity is c by two. This velocity is also c by two. Okay. Now, what is the time taken for this point to cross this point? Understand that after some time, the rocket A will be uh, in uh, somewhere in this position. Rocket B will be. somewhere in this position okay so both are moving with respect to each other 
this is moving in this direction this is moving in this direction so the total length should be calculated from tail end of the first one to tail end of the second one from here to here so the total length will be contracted how much will it be contracted it will be l not by gamma but there are two l not by gammas because the total length to be calculated uh, this one will be two l not okay this will be the total length so two l not by gamma should be there and the velocity should be c by 2 for one plus c by 2 for the next one okay so while calculating gamma you need not calculate that one while calculating gamma because uh, the tail end of the first one um, is you know the velocity of first one is c by 2 just so just calculate gamma with c by 2 alone but in the end total distance divided by total time will give total velocity will give you total time so total distance will be 2 l naught by gamma l naught by gamma total velocity will be c by 2 plus c by 2 that is c so 2 l naught by c gamma will be your answer so just calculate and let me know okay so, uh, if we can you have any doubt yeah please Sir, uh, are we supposed to do velocity addition? What? I didn't get you. Uh, can you please repeat? Uh, shouldn't we do velocity addition, sir? Yeah, we are doing velocity addition. That is C by 2 plus C by 2, yeah, actually. Uh, no, sir, the velocity addition comes uh, uh, like uh, U plus V by 1 by U V. 1, one by 1 plus U V, something. I didn't get you. Sir, uh, velocity addition uh, is a formula in a relativity, sir. When, uh, yes, speeds yeah, are, related to velocity addition is there, yes. When speeds are uh, very high, like uh, compared to C, we should do it in uh, like some, uh, in some formula, sir. Yeah, there is a velocity addition. Now, uh, velocity addition, uh, yeah, uh, actually, maybe, yes, maybe I may be wrong here, but uh, you do one thing, just do velocity, you know, calculate the velocities with C by 2 and C by 2 so with the total time C. I've just got an answer here. We'll just compare the answer. And in the next class, we are actually doing velocity addition. I think you are actually right. I think I just got it wrong here, maybe. Uh, I do agree that, yeah, there is a possibility there. But... Uh, please do uh, just as I said, and in the next class, we are actually doing velocity addition. We'll take up the problem, same problem again, and we'll do it. Okay. 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 So, in case I uh, go to wrong, uh, maybe, yeah, even I have a small confusion right now. I'm sorry for that. So, just calculate this one. The main thing is to understand the concept anyway. There will be length contraction. And you have to understand the total length it should travel. Okay, so the to total length will be 2 times L0 and the contracted length should be calculated and the velocity should be, the relative velocity should be considered. Okay, so just find out the answer and uh, find out the answer for the earlier problem also, the 3600 seconds problem. So just calculate that and uh, come with the answers for the next class. Okay, so the next modern physics class for you will be on uh, day after tomorrow, I think. It's at 8 a.m. Yeah, I think it's at 8 a.m. So uh, just calculate that and uh, come with the answers as well. Okay. So I hope uh, everyone understood this one, the concepts here, including, yeah. So I have a doubt in the second question. Second question. Uh, I'll just take a PPT. Yeah, sure. Ask me. Yeah. Uh, in that uh, velocity of the observer should be taken as zero. Where is this one? This one? Yes. The second question. Yeah. The, in the in the second question, see uh, the light of wave the light of wavelength or something it is reaching the earth from a distance there. So you are sitting at rest from the earth and you are watching the light. So a velocity of the observer something like we should take it as zero. Yeah. See uh, velocity. No, see, if you take the velocity of the observer as zero, velocity of the yes. observer here, uh, if 
you take it as zero, then uh, what you get is f is equal to f zero because it will be root of one by one. So f is equal to f zero. If you are not moving, you will get the same frequency. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what you actually need? See, what is the velocity of the star? Is the only thing that is actually see uh, the velocity of the star or the velocity of the observer. Both are actually the same. If one is at rest, see, I am at rest and you are moving. Okay, your velocity, say, suppose it is ten meter per second. It is the same as you are standing. I am and I am moving with the same velocity, right? It is relative to each other. Okay, so once you calculate the velocity of the star here, you are actually getting the velocity of the observer also in another sense. Yes. Okay. 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 So you are moving and I am standing. It's the same as. You are standing and I am moving. It will be in just in the opposite direction. Okay, I'm not clear. This one, are you clear? Yeah, if this is fine. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, please don't hesitate to ask the doubts. Okay. Very good. Very good. So this question, this particular question, yes, uh, I'll just confirm it and uh, come to you with the proper answer. You know, proper method and proper. I'll just write it down and take a photo of that and we'll get you. Okay. So uh, there is a possibility that uh, velocity addition should be used here. Now, by that uh, we have actually solved uh, a chunk of a good chunk of uh, relativity questions asked in previous years. Uh, you will get one or two questions mostly in exams, uh, but Questions from relativity are not guaranteed every time, but other topics are there are guaranteed. But uh, mostly, you will get one question from relativity. Okay. So with that, maybe we can wind up. Uh, shall we wind up, sir? Yeah. Okay. Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, we'll wind up with this one. Uh, we'll see you in the next class, okay? So have a good day, everyone. Thank you.